I am your host, Jason Miles, and this is Revolution Podcast. How is everyone doing? Happy Monday to most of you. If you're a patron, happy Sunday. Playoffs are on. Go go watch the This Is Revolution Sports Show. We are adding a sports show. If you want to get notified whenever these new shows drop, the best way to do it, subscribe to us on YouTube. YouTube.com backslash This Is Revolution Podcast. But this show... For longtime listeners, we used to do a thing when we first brought Cuba on, and we called it the Foreign Policy Thursdays. And as we got more show requests and had more guests, Thursday was just Thursday. And for a while, we tried to make Thursday be centered around foreign policy. Like, well, let's move this guest that's going to talk about Africa on Thursday. And it just didn't work. Well, now we want to get back to that. We want to get back to having a fruitful discussion, but it won't necessarily always be foreign policy. We call it the TIR Weekly Roundup. But for our foreign policy, we still have the wonderful Maria Repnikova with the Masha and the Bear Show for, for a more scholarly academic look at foreign affairs Masha and the Bears and that is the second Wednesday of every month on This is Revolution but in this show we take a look at a few things in, uh, that I found rather interesting number one we look at the life and politics the political moment so to speak of the rise of Sidney Poitier we look at Kazakhstan, not just the current situation, but we look at Kazakhstan uh, historically, because there has to be context in there. And then lastly, we touch on California, possibly being the first state with universal single-payer health care. And then it gets spicy. Oh, it gets spicy. In the champagne room, uh, there was a great debate with the Kuba Riznitsky and Pascal Robert over how the left should look at China. So if you want to hear that, because we do have it for audio only as well, there's only one way you have to be a patron. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake presents. And that is your link to hearing that very, very spicy conversation between Pascal and Cuba. Oh, so spicy. I just took me and Jean off the screen. And those two went at it for a while. Of course, not fighting, but... A very intense discussion. Cuba was in full PMC mode. It was a sight to behold. So I advise you guys, if you have the means and you feel so inclined, become a patron. Uh-oh. That music means I need to shut the hell up. Here is the Thursday Roundup with the whole TIR family. Thank you guys for listening. Wherever you're listening, subscribe to this show. I am out. Peace.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first Thursday edition of our weekly roundup that we will be doing with the TIR crew, the core members of the crew. And before I bring everyone in, I do want to remind you guys to, if you haven't already done it, hit the like, pretty please. We'd love it even more if you hit the subscribe and ring the bell so you're constantly notified whenever we go live. As some of you might have found out, we had an impromptu live stream last night uh, after a video essay of mine aired. And it really wasn't me pulling a power trip saying that only my video essay gets a react stream. Uh, there was a little bit of a reason behind it. Usually on the second Wednesday of every month, we run uh, Maria Repnikova's uh, monthly roundup episode, a more academic scholarly approach to world affairs. But sadly, uh, Maria was a little ill and wasn't able to, to do it. Uh, and every Monday we're going to be airing video essays. And because of my horrible internet connection, I wasn't able to get the video up on time. So we moved some things around for Wednesday and it worked. And we will be doing more reaction streams to the video essays that we do. We also be we will also be airing some of Doug Lane's uh, video essays from Diet Soap Media. Still working with the wonderful Doug Lane. And I think his Critical Cuts videos are brilliant. So we'll definitely be having more of them on our channel. But for the ones that we do, Kuba, Pascal, Jean Bajlan, and myself, we're going to do a little React video afterwards and see how you guys felt about it. Um, I'm kind of sad we didn't do one for Kuba, but that can be changed. Maybe we should do a React video for Kuba's two-part Russian Revolution history. I know you guys left quite a few comments. So maybe that's what we should do. Let me let me consult the fellas on that. So let me bring in my homie, my dog, co-host extraordinaire, the man that brings the Mau Mau to the bourgeoisie. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat, peace and greetings to the audience, peace and greetings Jason Miles. For those who do not know, you can check out my appearance on the Woke Bros with Wozni Lambre and the Nando Villa. It was aired yesterday. I posted it on my Twitter. Uh, we did a deep dish dive into the Haitian history and the revolution again uh, to commemorate the uh, Haiti earthquake, which was yesterday, the 12th anniversary. So check it out and let me know your thoughts. Uh, I'm excited. I, I, didn't, I haven't got a chance to uh, hear it because, you know, I've been dealing with my own thing here all day. Um, I'm excited to dive into it when uh, Wozni hit me up and was looking for your contact information. I was like, uh, of course. <laughs> and I'm glad it worked out. You guys are from the same area, correct? Not only the same area. I mean, we didn't know this beforehand. This only, We only stumbled upon this information after the the uh the interview he was like I, I hear you're from new york i was like yeah he's like i'm from new york I'm from queens i said what part and he said queens village queens village is literally the town over from where i grew up in Cambria heights and my elementary school was in queens village and then we proceed to find out that not only did he grow up in queens village 15 minutes from my house we went to the same elementary school and high school 20 years apart so wow. he literally attended the same Catholic elementary school that I did and the same Catholic high school that I did. And I mean, it was so uncanny. He was mentioning Haitian bakeries that my father used to go to back in the day when I was growing up. He's like, oh, you know what? X, Y, Z, you know, in Queens Village. I was like, what? That was incredible. But um, it was a good interview and he was a, he was a funny cat. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed him. Uh, I, I did... You know, he is a writer for The Atlantic, which is, he's a sports journalist, so. Oh, he writes for The Atlantic? I didn't know that. The Atlantic, The Athletic, I'm sorry. I knew it starts with an A. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> wrong, wrong A publication. This is a sports publication. Um, so he'll definitely be a, a guest at some point on our upcoming sports show, which I believe is airing this week. I want before I promise that I do want to find out with Marcus. Also, I want to say this while I got you guys here for patrons of the $35 tier, we will be scheduling our phone calls. You can call and talk to a member of the crew and it is a monthly thing and you can talk to all of it. Of course, you don't probably don't want to talk to all of us at once, but uh, hit me up on Patreon and let me know when you want to schedule that phone call and we will be scheduling those calls this week. I do want to say that. And before we bring in the Death Star's middle management, it looks like he's scolding a stormtrooper in the green room. Let's bring in everyone's favorite presser in the great city of Springfield, me, Jean Bajlan. Oh my! Do, do you see this guy? Do you see this guy? In the oh, oh Dylan Rodriguez. Do you see Dill? Hey, Dylan. I want to say, can we give a shout out to Dylan, whose son uh, uh, got into Dartmouth? Oh, so word! Let's go! Shout out. All right. shout out to Dylan for having his son getting into the most right wing reactionary Ivy League college in America. <laughs> 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 So yeah, you but they got a lot of lacrosse. You can well, some plays baseball. I mean, some plays yeah, very, very high level uh, uh, baseball. They believe he's on a traveling team. Um, Dylan, what's funny that he's in today because I was going to hit him up because I recently was having a conversation with Doug Lane about doing a live show in. Now I'm going to push it towards April in Dylan's neck of the woods in Southern California. So as we've been talking about getting to our thousandth patron, Mark, and we are going to be doing a live show and we're talking about doing a debate. I'm going to say the names of the people, but uh, we're talking about having a debate between a, uh, a Stalinist and a Trotskyist. That's not really. That's it, that's not. That's not a debate. It's a interleft. It's interleft nonsense. That's not a debate. It's going to be some interleft nonsense. It's going to be a lot. But of it's good viewing. Nonsense. It's good viewing. It's good viewing. You know, people want to it's see. It's going to be. It's it's going to be hilarious. If I'm not going to Trot tell you the on names, ML but, violence. There's going to be a lot of ML on trot trot on ML violence. Yeah, uh, it's, it's the is all those Ivy League schools are right wing. Is a fuck. That's true. <laughs> oh it looks like it looks like we got uh, our man back in the room so let's bring in everybody's favorite middle manager we have to figure out how the how the kuba shirt's gonna look we have to get a kuba middle management shirt made run pmc run pmc run pmc that's fucked up let's bring in the chairman of the Death Stars PMC, Dr. Kuba. Good evening, everyone. I'm looking forward to the debate, but I hope you really make a, a bank out of it. Like, there's a weigh-in, there's some trash talking, like, um, you know, determine how many rounds they go. Um, like I think that uh, it could be uh, could be quite spectacle. Is they gonna they're be? Not, are they gonna be? Chicago, they messing with your audio there, homie. They uh, <laughs> are they gonna be any uh, metal chairs for the uh, for, for the participants to use just in case? Maybe the Maoists will come in at the last minute with the metal chair and take everybody down. Uh, originally, originally. Uh... What, what I wanted to do was kind of have a little bit of a panel discussion. So now it's going to look more like a PBS uh, Chomsky uh, uh, Foucault. Debate. Foucault. I'll tell you one thing. The anarchists are going to steal all the snacks. That's definitely going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
oh, we're not going to have free snacks. It's going to be at a fucking like bar venue. It's going to be some punk shit. It's going to be metal as fuck. Well, that metal. means there will be anarchists. There will be anarchists there. Uh, we'll see how real they are. they are. They might have an anarchy shirt from a uh, hot topic. I don't know if they'll be like anarchists. Kuba, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. I'm trying to um, fix your audio. Yeah, to humanize my like voice modulation. Unfortunately, <laughs> you don't sound like Darth Vader's burps. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's set on intimidating phone call. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to get the knob. I'm worried. The AI it. is glitching. Kuba's the AI is glitching. Robo Kuba. Yeah, if I push it too too hard, then I'll end up at Wookie, and that won't be good for anybody. Oh, but Kuba isn't anyone's saying, Wookie. Look at the things people are saying in the chat about the Trotsky and Stalin this debate. A Trotsky, a Trotsky couldn't fight; would freak out and run away. Oh my God. I can't, I'm really excited for this. Did I tell you? I told you guys about this. Is, is, did I yeah, only tell Sheen about betting. this? I didn't yeah, tell you guys about this? About what? No, I didn't know. I thought about we were trying to avoid. Gonna, it's, it's, it's going to happen. It is going to happen. Why? God damn it, because it's going to happen. We're going to announce your book launch. A word? No. See? Oh. See? You were about to get excited for a second. What it did. Not really. I was going like, how was that gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking dick. <laughs> We're, it's 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 a lot of things are gonna happen. Kuba, is your audio working now? Can you hear me? Yo, yeah, we can totally hear you. Better? Yes. Late. Okay. So today Good. we're gonna be talking about a few different uh few different topics. Um this will st- will be a little current, but not so current eventy. But I think one of the things that Pascal wants to touch on is a pretty big uh, event, if you will, or, or happening that just happened. Pascal, you want to talk about uh, the passing of Sidney Poitier and his importance uh, in in Black America, especially during the Cold War? Yes, absolutely. I wanted to bring this up when Gene uh, offered to me subject matter that we could discuss of a various kind of political nature. And uh, I remember that we had had, I believe we had filmed maybe an episode since Sidney Poitier passed away on January 6th, 2022 at uh, 94 years old. And I felt that, I mean, I've seen various commentary. A lot of the liberal media chattering class has kind of you know, engaged in the uh, Mr. Black exceptional discourse. And, you know, I've seen some of the commentary from some folk on the left as well. But for me, uh, it was very important to discuss Sidney Poitier because uh, for, for for my generation, I would say Generation X, uh, folk who were born in the late 60s, early 70s, Sidney Poitier's imagery and his uh, media personality and the shadow of it loomed very largely in our consciousness because we kind of grew up watching at least perhaps not necessarily in film in in the actual cinema because we were too young but perhaps on television his his uh overall variety of roles uh from guess who's coming to dinner to uh, everything else to, uh, you know, the defiant ones, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. And uh, it was definitely important for me to address the context of Sidney Poitier overall in terms of uh, his significance in a particular period of time. And What's most important for me in terms of Sidney Poitier is that people often don't realize that this is a man who not only was shaped by the civil rights era as an actor in terms of the kind of films that he was playing in, but also he was very much uh, mentored 
by many of the black actors that came out of the 1930s and 40s uh, era of the communist era and popular front, particularly Paul Robeson, Canada Lee, and all of them. And if you want, read them, some of the old interviews between Sidney Poitier and, uh, and uh, Harry Belafonte, and they're talking about the reverence that they had for uh, uh, Paul Robeson. And they considered him you know, a significant mentor and very important to their life. You begin to realize that the, the kind of radical political milieu that Sydney is coming of age in, starting with you know the Negro Ensemble Theater in Harlem uh, in the in the forties, is very much populated by hardcore black leftists, many of whom suffered ve very serious reprisals from the rise of McCarthyism and the House and American Activities Commission. People like Canada Lee who was a very serious leftist, lost their capacity to find work and lost their ability to even, even function in the media. Paul Robeson, we all know, was significantly punished for his uh, left politics and was castigated even from uh, Black entertainers who were within his cohort. And one thing that we have to realize is that Sidney Poitier fills a very important space in that context because of the shift that is taken in the way in which Black imagery is depicted in film to fulfill a particular, particular purpose. And, and, and it's not often time that we actually understand the way in which the culture industry, which is Hollywood, uses media to shape political consensus. This is a quote from a book some of you may or may not have read. I know we talk about Adolf Reed a lot, but he actually has a very good black pop culture analysis in his book, Stirrings in the Junk. Uh, this is a quote where he says, even popular cinema sought to thematize black life in line with civil rights consciousness in films such as The Defiant Ones, 1958, All the Young Men, 1960, Raising in the Sun, 1961, Band of Angels, 1957, 1957, and the instructively titled Nothing But a Man, 1964. Those and other films were marked by an effort to portray blacks with a measure, measure of human death, depth and complexity previously absent from Hollywood productions. By 1957, even, even the great taboo of miscegenation could be portrayed, portrayed on the screen in The Island in the Sun. And a decade later, the cultural campaign had been so successful that this theme could be explored in the parlor rather than in the back streets and resolved with a happy ending in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. It is interesting that Dorothy, Dorothy Dandridge became the first black in a leading role to be nominated for an Academy Award for her role in Carmen in 1954, the year of the Brown decision. And at the most productive periods of civil rights activism and Sidney Poitier's film career coincided. Poitier's lead performance in the Maudlin Lilies of the Field won an Oscar for him in 1963 on the eve of the passage of the Public Accommodations Act. Thus endorsed by the culture industry, which affronted white supremacy in the late 50s by producing a Perry Como show in which comedian Molly Goldberg kissed black ball player Ernie Banks, the civil rights movement was virtually assured. So what's really important in that quote and what it's demonstrating, right, is that the culture industry was a very significant and important tool in the ruling class agenda of normalizing integration and the functionality and normalizing and presenting a redemptive image of Blacks, particularly using people like Dorothy Dandridge, Sidney Poitier, uh, Harry Belafonte, not so much because it was vested in humanizing Black people 
or the black image, but because it was a function of the ruling class prerogatives of American politics at that time. And we have already talked about how much of that politics was tied to the Cold War reality of America needing to improve its international image in the face of expanding Soviet communism's popularity in the newly independent Global South nation. And one of the things that I felt has not been discussed enough was how Sidney Poitier particularly was crucial in his kind of redemptive, vindicative narrative of Black masculinity in fulfilling that end. And this is my, 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 I have, by, by the way, I have profound admiration, respect, and and love for Sidney Poitier as an entertainer. And I have always known, going back to his relationship with Paul Robeson and those Black leftist actors of the 30s, that his politics were always more radical than whatever the cultural industry was even using, using him for cynically. And my position is not to kind of cast him as some kind of dupe, pawn, sellout, or, uh, or irrelevant individual. This is a man who risked his life doing the civil rights movement, going down to the South and raising funds for people who were trying to challenge Jim Crow. But what I'm trying to show is to illustrate for those of us, whether on the left or the right, who have a sense of a kind of, you know, you know, the ruling class is not that organized or orchestrated. And I say, there's some truth to that, but there are times where they have been very orchestrated and very organized and very determined, particularly in the utility of black imagery in cultural industry messaging, of utilizing black actors and individuals to perpetuate a message and an image of American society that works totally to the benefit and at the behest of the American ruling class. And I just want to say, again, my goal here is not to impugn Sidney Poitier, who I have profound admiration for, but to put him in the context of the overall geopolitical reality of what his utility meant for American empire at that time. I have a question, though. Do you uh, do you see that cultural shift, even if it is midwifed by elements within the ruling class? And I and, and I would agree you know, there is definitely a deliberate effort on the part of elements within the sort of liberal establishment of the United States to um, sort of uh, forward uh, black faces. You know, we see it with jazz diplomacy. We see it, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, I'm watching a lot of Disney cartoons from the 60s and 70s with my, uh, my with my kid at the moment. And, you know, a lot of black uh, actors are involved in those things. So, yes, I mean, like I would certainly say, you know, there is a self-conscious attempt to bring black people into the cultural sphere. But do you see that as a positive thing in general? I mean, like how how do we how do we approach that? How do we approach the reality that we see more black people getting into important cultural positions? And, but the you know those cultural places and that cultural space is being opened up by a ruling class, which is an attempting to project a progressive image of the United States within the context of decolonization, the Cold War, and America's kind of attempt to sell itself as the bastion of the free world. How, how do we how do we do how do we approach? That? I think I think that's kind of part of what we're going to be talking about in the in the champagne room too, with the because I think these representations are taking on a whole different look, um, especially with this revival of the. the uh, yeah, that kind of 80s nostalgia revival um, is also a way to completely reinterpret and recontextualize the um, something like the Fresh Prince. Oh, yeah, the Fresh Prince, uh, even New Jack City. There's a, a prequel that's in the works of for New Jack City, which, which seems extremely irrelevant, which is going to talk about uh, the how Nino Brown came to be. But, you know, if you've seen New Jack City all a thousand and eighty four times like I have, then you know that there's definitely a montage scene where they figure out that the free base is what's selling and it shows them um kind of over a five minute scene, you know, gaining well, I, power I, in the hood. I, I want to address Gene's um 
very uh, prescient question directly, uh, which, and Gene, if I'm miscategorizing your question, feel free to correct me, that the, the ultimate question is that, assume all things being true in terms of my presentation, that this was the motivation, this was done. In the aggregate, is that still a good thing in that the goal still is to incorporate Black people into spaces of visibility within the media industrial complex, if you will. And my position is, as someone who was on the left, and I would think that we all are in some perspective on the left, is that uh, diversifying the ruling class in a capitalist imperialist enterprise to facilitate the ends of the capitalist imperialist enterprise is not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's simply part of the real politic of the system maintaining itself. I think that part of the problem is us seeking to find value in those machinations in the first place and not simply having a cold event evaluation that this is primarily being done at the behest of maintaining the system. But at the same time, do I want us to go back to a day where the only images that we saw of black folk were uh, Bojangles, Stephen Fetchett, and, and uh, you know Hattie McDaniels? No, that's not my argument at all. I definitely agree that it is an improvement in terms of the depiction of black people to have them be humanized in a way. But one of the things about those films is that what is interesting, particularly, and I, I, you know, I grew up watching those films, is that the humanization of the Black character is always done on the terms of the normative white majority, upper middle class bourgeois society. You see, is that in that the, 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 in other words, if you look at Portier's films, you look at, you know, uh, Sydney, you look at Dorothy Dandridge, not he's, to bring he's up a story, gentleman. It basically like a 19th, early 20th century European Western gentleman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the thing is, though, like it's, it's, it's a kind of magic Negro ad nauseum kind of, you know, it's kind of like, look. <laughs> This Negro who makes us all feel comfortable. Oh my gosh, who's over, who's always superlative in his articulants, his articulation, his gentlemanliness, his educational level. I mean, I remember when I watched Guess, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, right? And I was fascinating to me. It's like you watch Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I used to really like that movie, right? And like, you know, it's about an interracial relationship. Obviously, it's in, ironic that the movie comes out the same year of the Supreme Court loving decision that makes uh, integrated marriage, marriage legal, right? That's and you know who had a good take on this? Melvin Van Peoples. That's interesting, because his parents probably, you know, well, he was, he was not biracial, right, Melvin? Was Melvin he? Van Peoples, I believe he's black as hell. Melvin Van Peoples brought out the fact, and, and I don't know if this is where you're going, and, I'm, you know, we have to, so many topics we have to cover, but, but there's a documentary that Melvin Van Peoples made about black people in some, uh, It's it's okay. And one thing he brings up about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is he points out the fact that Sidney Poitier's character is a very established, uber professional university professor that's with kind of a run of the mill average white girl. Well, I mean, the white girl comes from a kind of elite family as well, but and like. She's not as anywhere near on his level. No, she gets. No, she's marrying like. Super Negro. She's marrying like ultra black, you know, yeah. like Nobel Prize. That's what I like, think he was a know. Nobel Prize winner. There was something. There was something he had won the guy, in the movie. The character that she marries is yeah. a doctor whose specialty is like um, viral diseases in tropical environments, and he, he's done some kind of insane, ridiculous, like re, you know, research. I mean, he he literally is not only a superlative. In terms of black, he's a superlative as a human being. But what's fascinating about the show is that, like, what undermines all of this kind of like, oh, the noble depiction of black people is like, 
for the black guy to marry the white woman, he's got to be the best human being on the yes. fucking planet. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That 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 is yes. Um, so we also, should be. So we should be. We should be ahead, conflicted me. about. So what you're saying is we should be conflicted about Sidney Poitier is his role in cult in culture in America. I'm not conflicted about Sidney Poitier. I have I've, I will always have affection for the man as a man because I believe the man Sidney Poitier was more than those roles, and that I also realize that the man Sidney Poitier is a man who took serious risk in trying to fight to have black people achieve political and economic justice in America. And I also realize that Sidney Poitier is a man who created working class pop culture movies in the 70s, you know, Uptown Saturday Night uh, and all those other movies that were not rooted in kind of being the magic Negro for white folk. So he's a very complex figure, but I think that we should be aware, not necessarily conflicted, but be conscious, conscious of the way the media industry uses, and not only black imagery, but representative representational imagery to fulfill agendas that might not be necessarily rooted in the best interest of those particular various communities. So, so um, I, there's just like one thing that this made me think of, um, and you made a very good point that these roles and these types of films and these these narratives are working um, represent a kind of adjustment of America to a reality where there's decolonization and um, trying to create a, a counter narrative to uh, Soviet universalism. And if you, um, assuming that some proportion or some large proportion of white Americans at the time had very ambivalent feelings about black people, you know, they were racist. Um, is part of the adjustment putting out a, a type of propaganda meant for those audiences to um, kind of reduce their, um, you know, like white anxiety ahead of um, some opening towards uh, Black Americans? Oh, I definitely think that's definitely a large part of the consulate of the uh, of the of the uh, of the uh, equation as well. You know, media definitely has a role in shaping public perception. So, you know, having this kind of like charming, you know, you know, dark complexion black man who's always, always wearing the perfectly fitted suit, who is, you know, hyper articulate, even in, in, his, in his most, you know, angered periods, be, you know, your, your perfect image of the model black male by far is absolutely crucial, I think, to the project of normalizing uh, black America in the psyche of the majority white America at those periods of time. Well, moving on from Sidney Poitier, we have a lot to cover. And another thing we need to cover that Cuba wanted to go over is Kazakhstan. When we were putting this episode together, Cuba goes, man, I just got Kazakhstan. I really want to tackle that. I want to read this quote here about Kazakhstan. Roughly 2,300 Russian troops were dispatched to Kazakhstan last week. Kazakhstan's government has since reestablished its grip after its security forces forcibly eroded Oops, I can't read that because I don't have my glasses. Cooper, can you read that? Uh, end it. Ended. 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 Ended the unrest. Ended the unrest. To clear the streets in Almaty. So let's, let me stop you right there. Let me, let me stop you right there. What is going on in What's the deal with Kazakhstan? So there was um, a, because of budgetary pressure, the government um reduced subsidies on certain types of um, uh, petrochemicals that regular Kazakhs uh, use for transportation and uh, fuel the price increases were substantial if you were um, one of the poor in Kazakhstan which is or, or working class which is the, the overwhelming majority of the population this led to um, protests um, 
and the nature of the protests, the where they started, who was participating in them, and how they developed is itself very interesting, and I'd like to get back to. But um, the uh, street fighting in Alamasi became so bad that the government of um, uh, Tokayev had to request uh, support from. Uh, he activated the Collective Security Treaty Organization, um, which has been described as kind of the revival of a Warsaw Pact or a NATO counterpart, a uh, Russo-centric NATO counterpart. And now we're seeing that indeed it can operate that way. Um, those Russian, um, and not just Russian, troops from other um, uh, Sesto countries were involved, stabilized the security situation in Alamati, and Hundreds of people were arrested and handed the country back to Tokayev. So that's what um, the fighting was very fierce. Uh, they, uh, the Kazakh government shut down the internet uh, for a few days in order to prevent um, mobilization, organization, or information um, dissemination out of um, Kazakhstan. And now, it looks like uh, Tokayev might be able to stabilize the situation. Um, there might be reprisals, there might be concessions. But for me, the most remarkable thing is that we're seeing the Russian sphere of influence operate out in the open um, through its formalized instruments, in this case, the SESTO Treaty, um, and fairly effectively. Um, the unrest was put down and the Russian recognized incumbent has been uh, secured in this place. And I would, there's, I would, let's go ahead. Sorry, Kuba. And then there's an entire question of like, where did the unrest come from? How did it, um, how did the protests escalate? Was this a color revolution? But I'll put off to the side. Uh, Jeez, yeah. please. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things about context for Kazakhstan for people who are not super familiar with Kazakhstan. So, you know, most people in the West uh, know Kazakhstan from the Borat character, which is kind of like, you know, pretty racially or ethnically insensitive towards Kazakhs. He, the Borat character. Oh, it's, just, it's a horrible minstrel show. Uh, a, incredibly ignorant, too. He speaks Polish and uh, all of the Kazakh parts of the movie are filmed in Romania. Romania. It's deeply offensive for it's everyone. Deeply, deeply, deeply offensive. So Kazakhstan is, a, predo is a predominantly uh, uh, Turkic country. The Kazakhs are a Turkic people, uh, predominantly Muslim people. Although Kazakhstan itself today uh, has a very large ethnic Russian minority. But since independence and going back to the Soviet era, the apparatus of the Kazakh government has been largely in the hands of ethnic Kazakhs. And you've had this, uh, you've really what you have in Kazakhstan is the elite that kind of led Kazakhstan out of the Soviet Union and uh, towards independence um, has maintained control uh, over the country. They've uh, solidified their control in a very effective way because of the oil revenues. Uh, that you know they um, they moved the capital city to Astana. They built this like all these fancy new uh, buildings. The um, what, and what basically, was the significance of the moving of the capital of the capital building is this? Well, I think it's a, it was a, a it was moved to a more central location in Kazakhstan, but it was one of these big kind of uh, projects that these uh, regimes like to. Uh, engage in, and the, uh, Kazakhstan had good relations with Europe. Tony Blair worked for the former uh, Kazakh uh, president who ruled, uh, whose name is escaping me uh, at, at the moment, but who ruled uh, since uh, independence and who basically stepped down in 2019 and handed over power. Nazarbayev. Nazarbayev, yes. Nazarbayev handed over power to a kind of new generation, but again, Torkov is, uh, you know, is comes out of a, a, a very well established um, a family of uh, literary figures and sort of political figures in Kazakhstan. So you have this political elite in the country that has survived very well on the oil revenues, and obviously has distributed some of that oil wealth to the population to maintain their 
legitimacy. But of course, with the volatility of commodity prices, that system is breaking down. And you have a large number of problems. You have a lot of Kazakh youth, for example, are leaving the country to go work in Russia uh, as laborers and do low-end jobs there. So uh, there's uh, a lot of sort of pent-up discontent towards this elite, which lives this kind of luxurious uh, a political, uh, a luxurious life. So you have a kind of oligarchy in charge of the country, which has been in charge uh, since the independence of Kazakhstan following the dissolution of the Soviet Union and includes people who trace their political lineage back to the reformist period in the Soviet Union in the 1980s. And I think we're seeing a kind of, we saw some protests actually at, towards Nazarbayev, which kind of prompted him to hand over power to the next generation. But it was a handover within this oligarchy towards a new generation. And now, and you know, I was talking to our fr friend of show, Harun, who is not very well, who wanted to join us on this topic. And he said, look, the role Russia is playing here is the role that it played in 1848 in Austria. They're coming in to stabilize, uh, to stabilize uh, 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 an autocratic regime on their borders, to protect their own economic and uh, political interests. And of course, you know, there's a lot of uh, trying to put the Kazakh question into this uh, America, uh, China, Russia Cold War. And of course, there are American factions who are definitely going to try and take advantage of this. You're always going to have some people who are going to take, uh, try to use these protests to promote like uh, a regime change for a more friendly uh, American government. But it's important to recognize that these protests, and perhaps Cuba can go into it, are quite organic to this very specific situation existing in Kazakhstan, whatever the great powers around them uh, do. Well, let me let me ask you this question, Kuba. Uh, what would be the problem if Russia was to come in and stabilize a place like Kazakhstan? I'm not necessarily suggesting there is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not suggesting that it's fine either. I'm, I think that's a question. I, what I do think is significant is that uh, after a period of American unipolarity, which included um, the power to sort of uh, set international conditions for the use of force, basically the UN Security Council became the Oval Office. And the um, that type of preeminence, we see that um, there is, in fact, already a Russian sphere of influence. There is already a Russian security system that can um, intervene effectively in its neighbors and save favored governments, um, favored client governments in the neighboring states. And that is a significant development with, um, with a lot of implications for how um, the United States or Western countries or Western leftists should um, expect from Russia and um, the extent to which the current Russian geopolitics is an extension of both Soviet and even if you go back far enough, Tsarist security concerns. That um, it's a, that was an excellent comparison with uh, Russians going into Vienna in 1848. The preoccupation isn't seizing territory. This isn't a land grab. This is what from a brutally realist um, Russo-centric position might be called, um, you know, looking after your neighborhood. That's one way of reading it. Um, if one feels that the development of a Russian security sphere um, is some kind of threat to international order, and it very well may be, then it's something that might be, might cause concern, even if the only problem is the Part uh, great powers react to that reality being illustrated this way. Gene, you want to say something? No, I just wanted to kind of ask uh, Kuba about his thoughts on, you know, how this rebellion in Kazakhstan differs from some of the rebellions that have, you know, the color revolutions. Uh, many, like many of them, would were, you know, had right wing origins. Like if we look at Ukraine, the type of groups that were in coalition mm -hmm. uh, in, in the rebellion in Iran were like pro-Nazi fascistic uh, revisionist uh, uh, groups. 
but Kazakhstan, I think the the you know one important aspect is that some of this unrest started amongst the in oil and gas sector workers, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. The um, the timeline that I've seen, which um, uses uh, sort of domestic news reports to trace the escalation of the protest, has the protest starting with oil and gas workers in one of the main regions of gas exploitation, uh, protesting the fact that um, their wages couldn't adjust for the um, increases in fuel prices. And at that point, it was a union organizing working class, um, it's working class membership around an economic grievance. And this was, um, perhaps it was tolerated because it was seen as a, a legitimate non-political um, type of demand, mm -hmm. um, or maybe the Kazakh security state um, has deteriorated, is less watchful, is less ruthless, less capable. But whatever the decision um, to accept the initial protests, other groups sensed the opportunity and you had more mobilization. And it was largely quality of life and kind of domestic, um, cons domestic realities driving genuine discontent with a system that doesn't work very well for most people. Uh, and then, and, and so one could think of this as essentially like a textbook case of organic mobilization of legitimate grievances, something more similar to the Arab Spring than to the color revolution. Um, the Kazakh security apparatus has been very good at quashing pro-democracy NGOs and preventing that kind of foreign backed um, mobile, uh, opposition mobilization. So the foreign intelligence agencies didn't have the capability to be behind this. Um, but once the protest had achieved a certain level of, um, of, um, disruption, then you have other groups, uh, emerging, uh, that most observers blame the violence on. Um, either criminal or political or um, uh, other types of violent groups uh, creating, um, you know, killing and, and de destroying things in Alamati. Um, now, so you see every phase of the protest being a kind of domestic story, right? This, the authoritarianism uh, in Kazakhstan was less durable than a lot of people assumed. And that, <clears throat> however, the overall regional security apparatus created by Russia proved to be more effective than people assumed. So um, when the state went under, it could be bailed out by um, its regional power. And the fact, this is what the United States has essentially claimed was its role as world policemen. It turns out that at least in a significant chunk of Central Asia, uh, Russia is willing and able to play that function. Mm. Pascal, do you have anything you want to add? Not to say that what comes next is any better. I mean, my, my, my question becomes, um, how does this affect American geostrategic outlooks in terms of what's the U.S. Uh, perception of this? This, what's America's play? Is that what you're asking? What's what's the U.S. play here? Does the U.S. have a play? Does the U.S. even well, care? Does the U.S. Well, I think that, um, first of all, it shows that if you want to start a uh, conflict with Russia, you're dealing with a relatively capable, well-organized adversary. So if I were um, looking at the possibility of Russia entering Ukraine, um, then that data point would be one which would make me want to recheck what my strategic plans were. Um, on another level, is it so bad that um, Russia be the sort of global policeman doing dirty work in its backyard? Um, the Nazarbayev government was pro-Russian, but it was also very friendly with the United States. So if 
uh, perhaps this changes perception of what Russian um, influence in Ukraine would mean, right? The, in some ways, if you're um, sufficiently um, realist, and then um, maybe it creates an argument why overextend ourselves into Ukraine when um, the Russians could be partners in keeping this thing stabilized. But I think that that may be a little optimistic. In the end, it will probably just feed into the same uh, Russophobic narrative mm. that um, has led to increased tensions uh, over um, Ukraine and uh, created this brinksmanship, which is potentially quite dangerous. Well, here's a, here's an interesting question. Uh, how does this affect the Chinese geo strategy? Well, I think an important aspect here is to understand, you know, we have this Belt and Road Initiative, and obviously Central Asia is critical uh, in that initiative in, in terms of being just a geographical space, which the Chinese need to cross in order to access both Russia and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It's also an important place for hydrocarbons or like in, in, a, in a place like Kaza, uh, Kyrgyzstan gold other, you know, like all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, natural resources, as well as markets. But it's also a region that is not necessarily super stable. So uh, you have a lot of sort of pent up anger towards the kind of corrupt post-Soviet oligarchies that have dominated these countries. I mean, Kazakhstan, by Central Asian standards, was one of the liberal ones, you know, one of the relatively open and liberal states. You go to a place like Turkmenistan, where it was like a bizarre personal cult under Turkmenbashi, uh, and then you have Uzbekistan, again, another extremely corrupt, venal uh, regime, and, and, and Kyrgyzstan, again, permanently in a state state of like uh, a political breakdown and unrest uh, as different factions vie, vie for power. So you have, you know, China obviously does not want to have an unstable Central Asia. Uh, and at least in the short term, from a kind of short term perspective, propping up authoritarian strongmen who can uh, keep everything in order makes a lot of sense. A lot like the United States did during the Cold War, where they would back all these like hardcore dictators because they kept uh, they kept the country in order. So China does not I like China does not have to to my mind doesn't have this kind of missionary ev uh, evangelical uh, foreign policy of sort of spreading socialism or democracy or anything. It wants people to do business with. It wants stability and it wants to protect its strategic. Uh, trade routes uh, as cheaply as possible. So if Russia is going to step in and stabilize uh, Kazakhstan, then I don't, China is not going to have a, a problem. And at the end of the day, the United uh, States does not have like a huge amount of leverage in Central Asia simply because of the geography. It's so far away. It's so difficult to reach. They've closed down the bases in Kyrgyzstan, so they don't have the, the base there. They don't have Afghanistan. So America doesn't really have much of a, a say. So it becomes a question of Russian and Chinese uh, uh, interests. And at the moment, those interests align, but they could conflict in the uh, future. Who knows? Can this be viewed? I, one thing I, I would point out, just, just very quickly, um, the in addition to um, SESTA, uh, Kazakhstan is a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, which is also Russian and uh, Chinese uh, sponsored. Um, so the choice of which vehicle to use um, to request assistance is meaningful in and of itself. The um, Kazakh government didn't ask for Chinese support or um, the member or ask the membership of the Shanghai Cooperation Council, uh, cooperation organization. They were looking at the Russo-centric um, security system, and I think that the signal here is that um, as you know, similarly to what Gene said, that China is perfectly content with somebody else watching that neighborhood as long as uh, their relationship with Russia is, um, there's an alignment of interest and there's a sufficient baseline level of trust. I just wanted to make a quick uh, inquiry. 
is it possible that we could look at this and I'm willing to be accused of reading too much in this as to one of the multiple examples of how the United States, the West and NATO are diminishing in their power as the ultimate puppet master in geostrategic phenomenon in varying hemispheres parts of the world, but particularly in parts of the world that are within Russia and China's particular sphere of influence. Central. Oh yeah, absolutely. That was that was my whole point of uh, in the beginning that um, the long in Washington it's always 1996 and NATO is always capable of going anywhere and doing anything. Um, now this is a reality that uh, you know no one asked um, the United States what it thought, and that will take some adjustment uh many of us are already have already accepted that reality but in washington this will be a shock yeah i mean we've seen this and and i i would say i agree pascal like i think this shows that america is not really actually it, this shows american weakness around the world and we saw this in other parts of the world in the caucasus we saw the azerbaijan armenia war nothing mm -hmm. to do with the americans and and going back even further the Americans didn't couldn't couldn't do anything when Russia stomped on Georgia in 2008, and with so you know there are a whole bunch of Eurasianist political players. Certainly, there's Turkey, but Turkey's interests don't always align with the United States, and Turkey's factional politics break down along different lines. You have Eurasianist and Pan-Turkist factions, which you might think are the same, but actually are beginning to sort of splinter over an issue like Kazakhstan. You have Russia, you have China. The United States is very much a secondary player. That doesn't mean the United States is still not the dominant global imperial power, but certainly there are parts of the world where the United States just does not have any significant leverage uh, uh, in order to, uh, you know, in order to enact kind of uh, uh, policies that they want places like where they just don't even have the experience. Like the Russians, it's important to recognize they have experience in Kazakhstan. There's a Russian minority there. They have like over a hundred years of experience governing Kazakhstan. They have deep intelligence links the, uh, and things like that. They know what they're doing. It's like the Americans know what they're doing when they're messing around with Haiti. They don't necessarily have the same kind of institutional knowledge when they're dealing with a country in Central Asia where they don't even have cadre that speak the language. Well, according to what some people are saying, then the United States doesn't even know what it's doing in Haiti right about now, but it depends on you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would be the only thing I take issue with. It's starting to look a little slapstick. Well, the last point we want to make, and, and we'll have to make it quick, Medicare for all. California is considering creating the first government-funded universal health care system in the U.S. for state residents. The proposal, which lawmakers will begin debating on Tuesday, would adopt a single-payer health care system that would replace the need for private insurance plans. Lawmakers are debating two bills. One would create the universal health care system. Another would outline plans to fund it by increasing taxes, especially for wealthy individuals and businesses. Have you guys been hearing about this outside of me talking about it? I'm seeing it. I've heard about previous um, attempts in California to create a Cali-only um, healthcare system. And Cal is the is the name. It didn't pass in the past, but yeah. I have a lot of trouble seeing how this doesn't get struck down by the Supreme Court um, within a year. Well. Um... It's going to be a ballot measure, which was AB 1400. Uh, um, it looks like, oh. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that, that, that it's, it's, the, go ahead. Yeah. I don't think it matters if it's a ballot measure or not. Mm -hmm. You'll just have um, Republican uh, attorneys general um, or somebody suing um, that this is a violation of the interstate commerce clause and you have a conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Um, it's not uh, absurd enough 
argument to um, prevent them from endorsing it on purely political interests and kind of structural reasons. And the question is how much can California do before it gets legally challenged or what happens if you have a progressive uh, inflation at, that can either uh, pull back the lawsuit or, or change the Department of Justice's orientation. But um, yeah, like I, Obamacare ended up getting shredded. Um, Cali Care, I have difficulty believing that it'll survive. What if it was backed by the oligarchs in Silicon Valley? The, I mean, they're not super popular um, among the the really conservative um, legal ideological set, and the healthcare industry has too much to lose from this mm -hmm. because if California can do it then it's one of those things where you can't have both systems in the same country. Uh, the existence of one is going to destabilize the other. So if California has a, a public plan, it's only a matter of time. It's going to be like weed legalization. Um, and that the healthcare industry can When you say it. weed legalization, you mean where it gets infiltrated by big business? No, I mean where it starts um, in one place and then the momentum is towards inexorable expansion. Um, and I think that this is, if, it, if this can be made to work, then it's going to every state with a um, ballot system. I don't think so. I don't think every state looks politically like California. Every state doesn't have a governor like Gavin Newsom. That is definitely, I, I think, this is his big move for 2024. This is the legislation that he ran on in 2018. Um, there, also is, there, there also is some legislation uh, that he's looking to try to pass that would give, uh, and, it, and it's more in, in name only, and I'll, I'll only be brief about this because we are running low on time that would give uh, access to health care for uh, undocumented citizens. Um, this would also give health care to uh, undocumented citizens. It wouldn't be that large of a tax. And I do think a lot of the pushback that uh, Silicon Valley, that Silicon Valley got uh, during even AB five, which was the bill that caused uh, Proposition 22 to be written, health care. So being able to get the state to subsidize that cost, I think they would love that. To, to go in and then start hammering away on, on labor rights even more in the gig economy, which more and more Californians are, are being kind of forced into. Oh, yeah, I think they would love that. They're all about it. I'm not surprised this is coming out of the state assembly uh, representative from San Jose. Well, the question is the is not all sections of the American capitalist class uh, see it that way. Others see it as you know, even if it might benefit them in the short term, they I don't know if they would be willing to consent to the uh, principle being conceded. Uh, uh, so you know, I think. The point that even if they do pass it in California, and I will believe it when I see it, hmm. even if it does have that backing uh, of Silicon Valley, is I think there are going to be serious uh, legal threats because, you know, in a place like uh, even in Republican states, they've managed to like get the Medicare expansion through ballot initiatives, and and if if people start filtering out and saying, hey, look at California, look at that system, it's working. You could have a Republican legislature uh, and Republican governor, and then people voting for Medicare for for all, even if they are in a conservative state. And I think there's going to be a lot of resistance from the conservatives. The they don't play. They don't play fair. 
There's a there's yeah. good resistance right now from conservatives. Of course, there's resistance from the people that have been giving any sort of socialized resistance uh, or, or socialized medicine resistance from the top uh, from the start. The uh, American Medical Association, of course, the nurses are pushing real hard uh, for this. Uh, there's been not a lot of chatter, which has been surprising to me in a climate where the Internet blew up over things like forced to vote. And no one seems to be talking about uh, the first state to even bring this to uh, a vote. What do you think, Pascal? Do you think it's coming? Kuba's talking, but I can't hear him. Could, could finish your point, Kuba. Oh, see, what happens we talking about Medicare? Deep State got you. Deep State got Kuba. You, you talk about Kazan, and the fucking wheels fall off. But as soon as, as soon as you say what undocumented people get in healthcare, what? Hear me now? Can you hear me yeah. Now? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Yeah. The um, I wouldn't if I were the healthcare industry and this looked like it was going to pass because it had the backing of the tech giants, I would just give them a rebate. And a rebate, you said? Yeah, exactly. If they're concerned about healthcare costs, fine. Kaiser Permanente, you know will offer an 80% discount to a uh, large tech employers in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. and uh, kill this bill of yours. Good point. Well, we'll That's see. The- January 31st, we will see. I do think it will make it to the Senate. What happens there, we don't know. But what I am kind of shocked to see is that uh, I'm not really hearing much about it. Uh, other than the reporting I'm seeing in the LA Times and the people that are Hearing the stories from the LA Times, I'm not really seeing many people talk about it, which you know has been the hot book over the last what years there's, has been socialized medicine. And here we have a legitimate bill. We, we have a, a path to how to pay for it. And it's well, been we need to check out this um, as they it develops because I think that. Um, if this has legs, then things should change quickly in terms of people paying attention to it or and, and counter mobilization. Um, yeah, this could be a big deal. Well, on that note, we've went a little too long, but we will be continuing the conversation about the potential of Medicare for all in California and what that would look like possibly we're also going to get into china how should leftists look at china and we're going to talk about uh something i'm pretty excited to talk about is the new fresh prince of bel-air there's a new fresh prince and it's not the same old fresh prince he's not a joke cracking wise guy from west philly he is a street hard criminal and uncle phil is no longer fat or the voice of Shredder, the Ninja Turtles. And Carlton is a little edgy in the new first punch. Uncle Phil is, is also the voice of Rao the Conqueror in Fist of the North Star. Is he? Mm-hmm. He had a great voice. Rest in he peace. Was, he, was in some, he was in some great, uh, great things. Rest in peace. So for those of you that are patrons, the link is up. For those of you that are not patrons, become one. Be part of this conversation. I really want to hear what you guys have to say, especially when we start talking China. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake presents. Gentlemen, I will see you in the champagne room. Oh.